<laughs> okay, it's two o'clock. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to to the second lecture of uh, of, of of Morten on, on on machine learning methods. <clears throat> Sorry that we spoke a little bit in Italian, <laughs> but uh, I think Morten won't give the lecture in Italian. Just that so that you're not worried that. Um, <clears throat> you have to learn also Italian to understand the lecture. <clears throat> and uh, okay, you see already on the slide the the, 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 the topic of, of, of today's uh, of today's talk. And um, since you're all here to listen to Martin and not to me, <laughs> Martin, I will uh, hand over to you. And we are all very much looking forward to to, to your lecture this afternoon. Thank you very much, Martin. Hey everybody, good to see you folks. And as uh, Francesco said, I mean, I could have continued in Italian. Actually, one of the methods which we, which we have, uh, uh, which are called recurrent neural network, is actually used in language recognition and language translation. So that's one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, more popular machine learning algorithms. So I wished I had something like that, when, because I, I grew up in Italy actually, so I came to Norway when I was 15. And uh, when I spoke English uh, as a kid then back in Norway, uh, I had a very, very strong Italian accent. And uh, kids in Norway, I mean, Norwegian is not that different. I mean, there are many words which are pretty close to English. So they're very much used to English. And when they heard me speaking, they just collapsed from their chairs and just asked me to repeat the words again and again because they never heard anything such funny as that. So it took me many years to, to uh, improve my, my kind of English accent because I would typically speak, listen, if you don't behave, I'll send a couple of guys and shine up in your face. You get wish. So I would, uh, when I came to Norway, I spoke like that. And I, <laughs> it took me quite some time before I actually <laughs> got, <laughs> was able to. <laughs> no, Martin, and, I spent many years in, in, in Germany and, yeah. and now people tell me that when I speak English, I still have a German accent. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So the, the um, okay, folks, it's a great pleasure to be here again. And uh, uh, as we said last time, you will find all the teaching material online. So let me just repeat that one for those of you who didn't get the time to get the, uh, the links. Uh, I was also reminded of uh, putting online a link to the uh, how to use Git and GitHub. So I actually made a video. Uh, it's not Hollywood quality, unfortunately, so you would have to suffer me in, with my, uh, yeah, with my accent and all my stuttering. But hopefully, uh, that video can uh, give you some guidance on how to use Git and GitHub, which are very popular tools. So Git is a software, uh, is is a version control software, which I highly recommend, and it's widely used in collaborations. So if you go to some of these libraries in machine learning, you will find uh, that. There are something like close to 2,000 developers in, for scikit-learn, uh, approximately the same for TensorFlow. And these are, this is a community of people which shares code and uh, develop code together. So that's pretty impressive. And it, Git as a uh, version control software, together with providers like uh, GitHub, GitLab, uh, you have Bitbucket and many other ones, you have then the possibility to share documents with a... Uh, huge community and uh, it's a very efficient tool if you want to collaborate with your friends or your fellow students or or your scientific collaborators so this is where you will find the uh, the basic uh, kind of uh, wordings about the the material and you will also find the uh, the links directly if you go to this uh, survey link which you have here this specific if you click on this link here you get then to the survey of what we are going to cover. And you will find this in HTML formats if you prefer PDF for printing, uh, or if you like to use Jupyter Notebooks, because many of you have actually gone through the, the Python course in the last two weeks. And then you will uh, find uh, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks as well, which you can run. And actually, I'm going to run some of these Jupyter Notebooks uh, during this lecture here. So uh, getting back to where we were, uh, actually where we ended on Monday. So let me quickly say a little bit. So the plans for today is now to say some of the basics of linear regression. 
Uh, there are many mathematical aspects which we unfortunately will not have time to cover. Uh, I need also to say something about uh, probability. So last time there were questions about overfitting. How can we actually be sure that our model is not overfitting? And there's something which you will find again and again in the literature, and this is called the bias-variance trade-off. Uh, you have uh, things like resampling methods, which are widely used because often we have very small data sets. And with very small data sets, we, it's actually limited to, uh, uh, to what kind of degree of precision we can present uh, the mean squared error of a quantity, the variance of a quantity, uh, the mean value of a quantity, and so on. So we, uh, this is, goes also back to the uh, basic philosophy for most machine learning methods. So most of machine learning, the kind of methods you will encounter when you take a course, deal with predictions and you being able to uh, make and uh, fit to a specific model. So the predictions you make based on this fit uh, is something which you then hope are the best possible ones. So you want to fit something and then you want to use that model which you have developed which fits some data in one way or the other and you want to use that one to make predictions. So if you, on the other hand, take a more statistical approach, or often what is called the Bayesian approach, the standard machine learning approach is normally called a frequentist approach, because we look at the frequency of the data, and we are less interested in finding a probability distribution. So if you are interested in the probability distribution, you will typically enter into the world of Bayesian statistics. Now, nowadays what we are seeing is that there is a kind of convergence of the two directions, uh, because we, as phys in physics, we are often more interested in having a probability distribution. We want to estimate the error. So if you have a probability distribution, you can calculate the mean value of that specific variable, but you can also calculate uh, its standard deviation. So you can provide uh, the people who use that model you have developed, you can provide them with an estimate of the errors. Now, this is normally not possible with standard machine learning methods. With linear regression, on the other hand, uh, which is actually based on an assumption that your data are normally distributed, I mean the output, you can actually uh, infer a uh, exact value for the variance of the variables you're deriving, which means also that with a variance of a given variable, you can uh, estimate a confidence interval. So you can provide people with a, a confidence estimate. This is uh, something you can do for linear regression. Uh, for many of the other methods, you cannot do that. For like a neural network, what you get is a fit to the data. So you fit and you make a prediction. Whereas with a, a, a statistical approach, like a Bayesian approach, you would end up with a estimation and causation. So we are going to look then at some statistics and then we're going to look at methods which uh, originally were introduced in, avoid, in order to avoid the divergences in inverting a matrix. Uh, but you can link this with a uh, deeper mathematical interpretation. And you can also rephrase this as an optimization problem where you introduce Lagrangian multipliers. So this is one of the nice things with the many of these methods is that you need to combine insight from many fields. So what we are going to look more at, uh, so this aim of this set of lectures is to introduce some of the basic aspects. And uh, uh, here we are going to look more at ordinary linear regression. So we're going to look at the equations which, are, uh, which we derive, ridge regression, which is uh, uh, an extension of standard linear regression, or the standard least squares, which many of you have seen. And then we are going to look at some resampling techniques which become important. And then we have this uh, bias-variance trade-off. And you will always see this when, when you encounter uh, papers in machine learning and people are analyzing data. Uh, you, you will often see a mention of the bias-variance trade-off. And we need to demystify it a little bit and see what it means. And we are going to do this with a kind of hands-on approach. So uh, what we are going to do now, linear regression. Uh, linear regression has... There are extensions of linear regression. And one of the extensions is uh, kernel regression, where you can actually have more complicated functions you want to fit. 
but we are going to stay with linear regression. So that means fitting a continuous function, and then you have a, a linear parameters in terms of some parameters beta. It's the method of choice for fitting a continuous function. It gives an excellent introduction to many of the central features, and uh, it has what I would call an understandable pedagogical link with other methods. And you will see that later. You have analytical expressions for these parameters if you do standard ordinary least squares. And also with ridge regression, you can find these parameters, the unknown parameters of your model. They can now be extracted from analytical expressions. So the, um, this, you can also get analytical expression for statistical properties of mean values, variances, and confidence intervals, and more. And that's extremely useful. And there's an analytical relation with a probabilistic interpretation. We will not have the time to discuss that. But that is also a very, uh, very, very nice feature of, uh, uh, of, li of linear regression. And it's also easy to introduce concepts like bias variance trade-off and these resampling techniques. So resampling techniques, some of you may have heard of that. If you run Monte Carlo calculations, you may have heard of methods like the bootstrapping, uh, jackknife, lots of fancy names here. Uh, you have methods like the blocking method, which actually used based on a limited data set to improve the quality of your error estimation. So with a standard frequentist approach, what you calculate is this mean value of the sample of data. So you don't have a we don't have the probability distribution. We don't know what it looks like. And sometimes, since we now are dealing with many machine learning methods and we want to fit a function, we are mainly interested in the predictive power of this function. So we are less interested in an underlying probability distribution. So I am a physicist, and often for physicists, the probability distribution is more interesting. Uh, but we can then, uh, since we have a limited data set, uh, we have these so-called resampling techniques. Uh, if you run an experiment, like in my field in nuclear physics, uh, often you have very few data points. And since the experiment often takes weeks, uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the Itemba lab uh, close to Cape Town. Uh, that's the, uh, the South African flagship in nuclear physics, and it's one of the world uh, leading laboratories in nuclear physics. And the uh, Itemba lab, if you run an experiment, an experiment can have a price tag of millions of dollars if you run over a week. And it's very unlikely then that the advisory committee, if you say that I need more data, that they will give you more data because there's a long queue of people who want to run new experiments. So that means that the data you have is often the data you have and you have to live with that. So resampling techniques are very important. And then as you will see here, it's easy to code. Actually, it's uh, so easy that some of the exercises you will find at the end of the slides here, you will find uh, some suggested exercises and I'm going to look at the solution of, actually, you will find the solution in the exercises. But I would like to discuss some of these tomorrow. So I put some exercises, and if you feel tempted, take a look at the exercises. You can also, you will also see that uh, the, the, the solutions are there. Uh, so this is uh, basically uh, the main things of uh, linear regression. Uh, again, I would like to recommend uh, some of these texts. There is a, an excellent discussion in this paper by Van Wieringen. And then we have Pankai Mehta's article, which I highly recommend. Because everything there is followed by a Jupyter notebook. And this is the way one should do science. Then there's a textbook by Hasty, but I actually prefer Bishop's text. So that's the uh, slightly better text. And it comes because the Many of the statisticians, it's not meant as a criticism, but they tend to assume that you know tons of statistics. And in many of our bachelor degrees now, we've been a little bit sloppy with giving you guys a proper statistics background. So we typically scatter this background across different courses. Uh, so the, uh, uh, this textbook by Hasty, which is a kind of uh, uh, standard textbook in uh, statistical, learning data, uh, statistical learning and data mining, uh, they are a little bit, how to say, they assume that you know a lot of statistics. Bishop's book, on the other hand, goes much more, uh, goes in much more detail through the mathematics. Okay, guys, now we, we need to uh, 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 get back to uh, 
uh, some of the some of the basic things and, and I'm going to switch to the uh, to the whiteboard here so that we can slow down the pace a little bit and I don't put you guys to sleep with me just talking over slides so you should be able now to see my if everything goes fine here you should be able to see my whiteboard so the uh, uh, what we are going to set up now are the basic equations for linear regression period nothing more than that and then we are going to see how we can program this so this is linear regression. So what we are going to have now are our data sets. So we are going to have a data set uh, X. These are the in, typically the input data. They often have uh, many different names in the literature. So we assume now that we have a vector X where we could now think of uh, some data points X0, X1, up to some X n minus 1. So I'm writing this as a vector now, so this is a transpose. Uh, I'm going to use this kind of vector notation here. And then this data here can actually be increased in case I have some additional features. So what I'm assuming now is that I have one feature only. But in general, what we could have are something like uh, a given number of features. So what we could have is something like P features. These are also called the explanatory variables or the predictor variables. So if I am, uh, if I am, for instance, uh, making a, uh, let me just see, there's a question in the chat here. Oh, so the, uh, uh, the feature, if you think of uh, uh, you now uh, fitting a polynomial, it means that uh, you could now think of uh, every such uh, uh, x values corresponding to the degree of a specific polynomial. Or if you're looking now at uh, a data set of a, uh, of a cancer, you could think that you have n patients. So in this case, we have uh, this i, this date, this x. So we have only, only one feature, but in general, we would have more features. So x in this case is now a uh, real valued function with dimensionality n. But we could have many features. So if I give you now n equal to 1,000 patients, and I'm looking at different types of tumors, I would have a feature like the radius of the tumor. I could have the thickness of the tumor. And some of these data sets, they contain up to something like 30 features. So that means that uh, I'm going now to change this vector to something which is going to look like, so this x of i, I'm going to define a new vector, and that could be, sorry, I'm just, and this should actually be equal to, so this new vector could now contain an x i for feature 0, it could contain an x i for feature 1, and then I can have up to, so i, it refers now, for instance, to patient i. So say that i is equal to 100, this is patient number 100. And then you have extracted some data where you now have up to p minus 1 features. So that means that uh, I would now define something which is called a design matrix, because I have uh, uh, n data and p features. So that means that this x now, which I wrote as a vector, that is something which I will rewrite as a matrix. And I'm going to define this as a real valued matrix, which now has n entries and then p features. Now to every one such feature, so in my, I have my outputs, so I would have a y of i. So this is the output. Uh, some people also call it for the target, and this depends uh, very much about the field you're looking at. In, uh, in natural science, we would often call this the output. Uh, and you will often encounter this as a feature as well. And this i, in this specific case, this i runs from 0, 1, up to n minus 1. Now you may ask, why do I start with 0? Well, I'm going to link this with Python programming. And you know that in Python, you start the first array with, the first array element starts with zero. Uh, normally you would have seen this going from one up to n, but I'm gonna do the other, I'm gonna start with zero and end with n minus one. 
because that has a straight connection with the, the way we would write Python arrays. Then we have, so this is the data. And what we have then is a list of uh, uh, inputs. So this X's, or we would have this design matrix here. And then we have the outputs for a given number of I here. So this is the data set which we have. And then we want to make a model. So in linear regression, the kind of model which we make then is that we are going to make a model and I'm going to put a tilde on top of the model. So that means that this Y is now being my model. And I'm going to write this as a function of this matrix X, which now contains the input variables, multiplied with beta. So beta is now a vector. So Y is going to have dimension. So this is a vector which now contains all the output values. So these are N. So this could be the outputs of uh, this cancer data, where you could say that output 1 is you having a benign tumor and output 0 is you having a malignant tumor. That could just be an example. Or it could be the value of a function where you feed in a value x and then you get an output y. And now we're going to make a model. And the reason why we call this a linear model is that this is linear in the parameter beta. So we are making up a model this means also that when I now look at this y of i tilde, that is going to be given by this matrix multiplied with the parameters beta. And I'm going to explain to you now what this notation actually means. So I'm going to use this kind of uh, strange notation where I put an asterisk here. So that means that uh, in this matrix, each row is now my uh, given uh, data element i. And that multiplies with the columns of the vectors beta. So this beta is now a vector of dimensionality, the number of features which I have, of p. So let's look at a very simple example. And this is something which many of you have seen before. So let us now assume that we are making an assumption where we have a, a polynomial we want to fit. So this y here, so let's look at this example. So my y is now my attempt to fit a function. So I have a y of x. So x, when I write it like that, without any subscript, I'm thinking of vectors. So I'm going to let this go over to y of i tilde. And this is going to be a function. This is the same as y of i of this x of i. And in our case, this is going to be equal to some polynomial. So I'm going to start with a j equal to 0. And this goes up to a p minus 1. So I am trying to fit a polynomial of degree p minus uh, 1. So if uh, uh, the, the number of features is equal to the number of data sets, then what I'm trying to do, if I have 10 points, I'm trying to fit my data with a ninth order polynomial. You know that if you have two points, you can fit a first order polynomial. If you have three points, a second order polynomial. Uh, four points, you can fit a uh, third of the polynomial, and so on. So what we have then would now be these uh, beta j's, these parameters, and then I would have x of i to the power of j. So that means that I would have something like a beta j, beta 0. I would have a beta 1 times x i to the power of 1 plus beta 2 to x i to the power of 2 till the final degree of the polynomial which I want to fit. So that means I would have a beta of p. So these are now the parameters I want to find. And then I have an xi to the power of p minus 1. Now you see what, what you can do next now is that since you will have such a quantity for every single line, every single value of y, so I would have a y0, and that would simply be my beta0, plus a beta 1 of x 0 to the power of 1. And then I'm getting lazy, guys. Eh? So I just write the last one, x 0 to p minus 1. And then I have a y 1. That's going to be a beta 0 plus a beta 1. And then I have an x 1 to the power of 1, plus up to beta of p minus 1 again. And then I have x 1 to the power of p minus 1. 
And this goes all the way down to the last data point. So this is my last if, uh, value, which I now obviously want to compare with my final target, the outputs. So this is the model I'm making. And this is a model which is linear and the parameters beta. But the polynomial degree I'm plugging in is a polynomial of degree p minus 1. So 1, and this goes all the way to beta of p minus 1 again, and xn minus 1 to the power of p minus 1. And guys, it shouldn't come as a surprise if I rewrite this now as a matrix, right? And uh, that's what's going to simplify life a little bit. So I'm going to assume now that this y here as a vector. So remember now that y, so y would now be a vector which now contains y0 tilde, y1 tilde, and y n minus 1 tilde. And that's going to be given now by a matrix. And we see now that we would have ones here, all the way down here, just ones. And then we would have x0 to the power of 1, x0 to the power of 2, and this goes all the way to x0 to p minus 1. Let me see, there's a question in the chat here. And, and you guys, you seem to be the one who wins the, the vote show here. So there's a question in the chat. When doing the prediction using regression, when do you decide whether to use multilinear or linear regression? And how accurate is the result of the model? So the... Um, this is uh, uh, actually the recurring problem when you're dealing with any type of fitting and using a type of model. So what we need to find then is a way to assess the quality of the model. And the typical way you would do that is to use something like a mean squared error, where you assess the difference between the data, the targets you have, the data points you want to fit, and the model which you have produced. And normally what you would do then, you would pick the model which you think makes the most sense, which contains perhaps uh, uh, the kind of uh, science you think is relevant, or uh, the, uh, the uh, or you would simply just take the model which gives the best mean squared error, or the smallest mean squared error. That's often where you end up. And clearly, you would also try to strike a balance between computational expenditure and uh, uh, quality of your results. So if you are using something like a weak on a neural network optimization of the same data, which you can fit by matrix inversion with a simple linear regression, you would choose a linear regression. So what's normally done with beta zero is you take away the intercept because you're going to scale the data. So that's something which when you go to libraries like scikit-learn, uh, we will always, and that's something which comes a little bit later today, we are going to scale the data. So, and, and you will see that, how you get rid of beta zero. Normally, you can fit with the intercept or without the intercept. So what we would have now would be an x1 here, and then up to an x1 to the power of p minus 1, and then we go all the way to x n minus 1, up to x n minus 1 to p minus 1, and this is then finally multiplied with these parameters beta 0, beta 1, up to beta of p minus 1. And then the uh, you see that this matrix here, this is the matrix X, and we write this as a beta here. So X, as we see now, has dimensionality R of in, in a real valued uh, matrix with dimensionality n times p, and beta is a vector of dimensionality p. And obviously y has dimensionality n here. So in case you have only one uh, feature, this clearly reduces just a vector times a vector. So when I write uh, this kind of strange notation which you saw up here, if you look at back at this type of notation, what that means is that I'm actually picking out uh, one of the values, y of i here, one of these, and I'm performing the multiplication. So I would pick a y of i tilde here. So any questions so far? I mean, this is, uh, this is the basic which we need to set up. 
And now the thing which we need next is actually to find how to solve these equations. And when we're going to solve these equations, uh, what we're going to, so we need to set up that matrix, but we need to define now the next element in machine learning. So we have the data. So this was the data. Okay. And then what we also did, we made a model. So we have the data, we have X and Y, and then we made a model where we say that Y tilde is given by this matrix X, normally called the design matrix or the feature matrix. So this has many names. So I normally use a design matrix or feature matrix. Feature. Uh, actually, depending on the context, you will uh, see different names for these quantities. Then the next point is, how do we assess the quality of the model? And that goes back to some of the questions which we had in the chat here. So how to assess if this is a good model, if the model is good or not. So that's the basic questions, to be or not to be. Is our model the best one or is it just a crappy one? How do we decide that? And you will see later today, when we come to this uh, bias variance trade-off, that there are actually uh, s some kind of guidelines which we can use to decide whether this is a good model or bad model in the construction of the model. But this is actually the, uh, uh, the, the big question when you do machine learning, what is a good model and how do we define it? So you can fit uh, your data with a model which doesn't make any sense but you can have a perfect fit. So that's fully possible. Actually, I, I've never encountered cases like that. Most of the models I've made, I've made them based on my physical intuition. But now if you look at uh, uh, this question here, because I remember, if you remember from Monday, I mentioned the three basic elements in machine learning. One, the data which you have. Two, the model you make. And then three is how to assess it. So if you now have, uh, your data, so we have y, and we have this model y tilde, which is x times beta. So how do we assess? So what kind of measure would you introduce in order to assess the quality of that model? So what uh, does your mathematical intuition say here? What kind of measure could we introduce? There's one which you probably have seen many times. Any good suggestions? Exactly. A root mean square error, or just... So the kind of function, so this defines, this assessment process, that defines something which in the literature is often called the cost function. You will sometimes see it labeled as a loss function, or you will call it, see it as a risk function. If you are doing finance, you will find it as the error functions and so on. But the mean squared error. And I'm going to define that one now as a function C of the parameters beta. And we are going to write that one out in terms of the mean squared error. And that's an expectation value. It's a sample expected value. So we don't have a probability. So we are using, we are hoping that this mean squared error is close, if you have the probability distribution, to the true mean squared error. But we don't know that. So we are going to have a sum of i equals 0 to n minus 1, all the data points. And then we simply take this one minus the model which we have, and then we square it. That's the mean square error. Now, the, uh, if you now think of this quantity, this is something we have seen many times. Uh, is there a uh, reason why we would choose a function like that? I'm thinking of a mathematical reason now. And this leads to the next point. How do we find these parameters beta? So let me give you a hint. So what I want, I want an optimal beta, beta optimal. And I will often write it with a beta hat because that's what statisticians do. So if there are statisticians in here, they always get stressed if I use some other symbols than the hat. So this is given by the argmin. So this is a minimization of beta element in this R of P. 
And this is what we're going to do now is to minimize this function of beta. So if you look at that one, um, and we have defined the, uh, the mean squared error, is a reason why we took that one? What if we decided another function? Suppose we, we could have taken this one, and I'm skipping the one over n, but I could have taken the absolute value, the absolute error. There's nothing which hinders me to do to do that. Do we have any good reasons for picking one? We can take derivatives, exactly. And we can actually get, if I take the mean squared error, I have analytical expressions for the parameters beta. And that's something which I would have problems with if I were to uh, deal with that from uh, the relative error or the absolute error, because then I would have to take the derivative of an absolute value, and that would give me a discontinuity. And mathematically, that is something we can do. So if you go into the field of convex optimization problems, because these are optimization problems, what you will often see then is that uh, when you have a convex optimization problem, if you have a uh, absolute value you need to deal with, that always complicates the algorithm. If you instead, if you stay with the, this function which we have here, so we can rewrite, so let's stay with the mean squared error, we can rewrite that one in terms of uh, uh, the model which we have. So I would rewrite it like 1 over n, and then we have i equal to 0 of n minus 1, and then I have my y of i minus this matrix xi. So I'm taking the row i, and I'm multiplying that one with the vector beta squared. Or if I now rewrite this in a more compact way, I can rewrite it in terms of a vector. So I have a vector y minus the matrix x times beta transpose times y minus x times beta. And then we are going to minimize this quantity here with respect to beta. See beta of d of beta. So in the, in the lecture notes which you have here, uh, you will find more in-depth derivations of uh, these expressions. So what we are going to do now is to minimize that one, and we want to put that one to zero. And so, so linear regression itself, and probably uh, you guys, I hope you don't get offended if uh, I now uh, do this, because many of you have probably seen this when you took a linear algebra course. So I hope I'm not offending people here. But probably many of you did this back in kindergarten. I'm pretty sure that you did that. So if I now take the derivatives here, uh, what we end up with is an expression. So when I, um, I'm writing this now in terms of a matrix, so you can use matrix derivatives, uh, what you will find then is that this is now given by x of t, the transpose of that matrix, multiplied with a vector minus x times beta. And we want that to be 0. It's actually not so difficult. If you take the derivative, of the, these expressions. So you could take the derivative of either this one for every value of beta, or you can just take the derivative of the matrix and the vectors, and you will actually end up with the same equation. Actually, when you take the derivative here, what you end up with is that you will have a factor of minus 2 times n. So there's something which I have suppressed here. When I take the derivative, is is a minus 2 over n. But since we're putting that to, to 0, uh, we can just multiply these constants away. So we don't need to deal with these constants. So I suppress them in the expression there. So that means the following. When I now go back, so what I need to do now, when I want to find the parameters beta, so I get that x times beta is equal to, actually have x times x transpose is equal to x transpose times y. And that means simply that my beta, the parameters which I have, are given by xt of x minus 1 times xt of y. So this is a linear regression, standard linear regression. And that means that I would have for every of these parameters beta, what I simply need to look up now is the product of this matrix. So you remember now again that x has dimensionality n times p. So that means that when I take the transpose, then it means that x of t times x 
gets a dimensionality of p times p. And then I'm multiplying that one with x of x transpose, which so I get a matrix now which has them in so I have dimensionalities p times p and that's inverted and that is multiplied with something which has dimensionality p times n and multiplied with something which is y so the vector y here which has dimensionality of n so what you see then is that this ends up with beta having dimensionality p as it should so beta zero, uh, you can include beta zero here. So that uh, is included in the model. Or, as you will see a little bit later, we can subtract the intercept and fit it because the intercept just gives a scaling. And normally when you use a function like scikit-learn by default, the intercept is never included, beta zero. So you would always normalize your data in one way or the other one. And a typical way you would normalize it is to take the mean value of each column. Now, what we have done here now is the, uh, the uh, is simply to set up a model, uh, which is based, in our case, we had a polynomial, which we wanted to fit, but we, like we did here. So this was a function we fitted, but it doesn't need to be a polynomial. And now comes a very good question here. So, if you look at the matrix here, uh, you could make this more general. So, this matrix X, so let's look at that one. So, this matrix X, we can write it in a more general way. So, we would have an X0 of 0, X0, 1, and this goes up to X0 of P minus 1. And then it goes down to some X uh, N minus 1 of 0, and then we have X n minus 1 of p minus 1. There's actually a very good question in the chat here. So one thing we could do, so in our case this was a polynomial. So the example which we took now, each row represents polynomial of a given degree. So we could have x squared, x cubed, and so on. So if I make such a polynomial ansatz, uh, I, I am not limited to polynomials because what I could have is that some x uh, i of j could be something like a function of a cosine with these arguments, right? x i j. What could be a sine? What could be some other complicated functions? But if I take a polynomial ansatz, would you expect this matrix to be invertible without any pain or problems? So what's uh, one of the conditions for a matrix to be invertible? So there's a very good question in the chat here. And that is, is x, t, x invertible? So if I do a polynomial approximation, so each column represents now a polynomial to a certain degree. So it could be x, x squared, and so on. The determinant is not equal to zero. Excellent. So the, you know that if the matrix uh, has to be invertible, uh, that means that the columns should be independent of each other. And the, um, uh, for the matrix to be, if I take a polynomial approximation, then we can often proceed without thinking too much. However, what happens normally is that your data set can be strongly correlated. And when the data set is strongly correlated, what often happens then is that you cannot use a straightforward uh, matrix inversion problem. So when that is not the case, so one thing you could do, and this is a very cheap trick, and historically, that was the way ridge regression was treated. So if you think of a, a numerical simple cheat you could do in order to invert a matrix, what could that be? Suppose now that you see that your matrix X is X transpose. Suppose that this lovely object now leads to problems. So this uh, is a trick which was used back in the 50s, 60s and 70s in order to treat matrices which were uh, having problems. So what kind of... Chi yeah, that's... So what you're writing is actually the way you can do that. You would have the... You would calculate the pseudo-inverse 
or you would use singular value decomposition because you can the singular value yeah exactly so the simple cheat is actually to add something along the diagonal so if not what you could do then is actually to rewrite your matrix xt with a new matrix xtx plus a lambda times a diagonal matrix well, lambda could typically be a small number. Suppose lambda could be 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 6, just a small number. And then you can invert the matrix. This actually leads to what's called ridge regression. And ridge regression differs from ordinary uh, least squares by having a matrix where we have added a parameter. Now, you can justify that mathematically later if you use the theory for Lagrangian multipliers, and you rewrite this in terms of a more general optimization problem. So the, um, uh, this kind of trick was, has actually been used in, uh, in dealing with that. But the way you should do that, uh, the proper way, and you will see that that's normally done in these libraries, you would all either calculate the pseudo inverse, or if you're asking me about my favorite algorithm, that's the singular value decomposition. You can always singular value decompose a matrix. So that's the golden algorithm in linear algebra, singular value decomposition. And that allows you always, we are not going to deal with these details. Unfortunately, we won't have the time, but this is the way you would deal with it. So either the pseudo inverse or the uh, singular value decomposition. In my Lecture notes, you may find some information, but in those slides of Van Veeringen, you find much more. Now, you guys seem to be pretty, you know, many of these details. Now. This is excellent. So, the um, it's important to know these things. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have time. So, any recommended material? So, the um, uh, I actually have a, guys, there is a, there's a textbook on deep learning, which I recommend highly and that's the textbook by uh, by uh, Joshua Benjo and the company so I'm just going to put it in here and you'll see immediately here you get the deep learning and the thing is that uh, what they have done now is that they provide you so you can get the whole book here and uh, they have a very nice discussion here on linear algebra where these topics are discussed and then clearly if you want to study the singular value decomposition. So th this link, I'm, I'm just going to put this in the chat because you can actually pull down the whole book. Ah, fantastic. Somebody already did it. You guys are much faster than me. And then you have the book in uh, uh, linear algebra or matrix uh, matrix operations. And that's simply the, the book by Golub and Van Loon. So if you want to go to that one, it's called matrix computations. So this, and you will, you will actually see that there is a copy of it already. And that contains everything you want to know about. If you're in doubt about matrices, this book contains everything you need to know. Uh, guys, uh, what if we take a small break? Let's uh, do some five, five, ten minutes and just stretch legs. And then we go back to... Uh, calculations now with the Jupyter Notebooks, if that's okay with everybody. If you take a small break, is that okay with everybody? Perfect, uh, Morten. I think nobody will have <laughs> any complaint. And uh, so people can digest a little bit what they've yeah. just learned. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe download the books <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, without uh, challenging the video link. Yeah. Okay, and um, we, we will have a, a quick coffee break. Yeah. And, and should we meet then five to three? Is that all right? Or should we do three? Whatever you recommend. Let's, let's do five to three, huh? if that's okay, okay with everybody. Perfect. Yeah? Perfect. That's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Then we just leave the connection on. Yeah. And um, maybe we put it on silent so that we don't hear the noises of all the coffee machines. And, uh, <laughs> and we come back in six minutes. But also, if, if you guys have questions, I mean, you can unmute yourself or put them in the chat here if you want to. Perfect.
lo bata boy e biste tinga ye. So kiza la ki mambele koma manga nzoku. Non la ki sa e pot kani sa pete pa ko change ide ye. Maybe we should start singing, guys. I mean, it's... Maybe we should start singing. Yeah, yeah. Guys, I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah. Or you can start singing lecture. Or you can start yes. singing lecture. <laughs> <laughs> we seem to have an echo here, right, by the way. We seem to have an echo here, right, by the way. We say, Francesco, should we just begin again? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just gone okay. five to three. Uh, okay. If you are ready, yeah. we are ready. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. It's, it's really a pity we can't meet in person, folks. I mean, I would love to, I would love that. Next year, next year yeah. we'll, again. we'll do that. By the way, uh, you will see me going to Hollywood or my attempt at going to Hollywood. There's a video which I posted in here. There's a link on uh, Git and GitHub. So it's a little bit long, actually. The, uh, but the the money the money better work the many other ones online, and actually the homepage of Git has many good videos, introductory videos. Now the uh, thing I want to do now, we're armed with the wisdom from the previous lecture, and also what we did on Monday, on this uh, nuclear uh, uh, binding energies. Uh, what we could do now is to write our own function for setting up the fit to the data. So in this specific case, we're actually making a polynomial expansion. So the number of features are going to be defined by that polynomial. So I'm just reading in the data again, like we did. And uh, if you have not used pandas before, I really recommend using pandas. So this allows me to read in a formatted file where I'm now picking the columns which, are, which I'm interested in. So it has many columns uh, and the, uh, each column has a specific header. So I'm picking out the binding energies and the uh, value of the, uh, of the number of nucleons, the number of protons, number of neutrons and the element name and so on. And now I'm setting up my design matrix. So what I'm setting up now, I'm picking the data. So I'm picking only the largest binding energies for every nucleus. And then, sorry, I'm now, yeah. Go ahead, please. I, I I'm not sure about everyone else, but I see still see your iPad screen. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I I forgot to switch from the iPad. Sorry. Okay, okay, no worries. I have the. Um, so let's thanks so much, eh? That was. So the um, the um, uh, what we had on on Monday. Uh, was this example of the uh, nuclear binding energies. So we had this uh, file with something like 3000 plus uh, data on nuclei. And we wanted to fit that with this specific model, which is called the liquid drop model, which is a simple parameterization as a function of the number of nucleons. So the number of nucleons is equal to the number of protons plus neutrons. And uh, the file is uh, something you can find easily in this uh, GitHub address. Uh, I love using pandas, as I said, and uh, that allows me to read in and format the uh, different columns and uh, the data which I'm interested in. So this file has uh, tons of columns, but I'm only interested in some few of them. And I'm interested in the binding energies because I want to make a fit. I want to group everything by the number of nucleons. So I'm going to make a simpler fit. So I, I'm a little bit agnostic to the difference in neutrons and protons. But I'm also interested in writing out the, 
the number of neutrons and protons. I have the element number, and then what we need to set up now is this design matrix, which we discussed before the break. And in this case now I have five uh, features. So I have the intercept, I have a to the power of one, a to the power of two thirds, a to the power of minus one third, and a to the power of minus one. So this is my attempt at making a fit. So each column corresponds to a feature now. And then each of the rows corresponds then to the, a given nucleus. And in this case, I've singled out only those which have the, for those which have the largest uh, energies. And then you see they have the number of nucleons, A, 1, 2, 3, and so on, to 270. And uh, in this case, I'm now set, so the first column is obviously 1. That's the intercept, which I want to fit. And the next one is uh, a to the power of one. And as you see, that fits well. And then it's a to the power of two thirds and so on. So this is a simple way by which you would set up the design matrix. So as I mentioned on, on Monday, one of the difficult things is actually to set up the design matrix. Uh, so there's a question now, this is the design matrix. So that does not contain the target value. Because if you go back, to the, uh, to the model you have now, you need to set up this matrix X. So that's the one uh, you would need to set up. And now my target value is the one when I now make the fit. So what you do when you make the fit now, so if we go back a little bit uh, to the equations which we had, so this is the model. And so what I need now is simply to invert this matrix. So my, my target values are not included in the design matrix. That's where you plug in the input variables. And then you make a model, which now is going to connect your input in these x's with uh, the output. Now your model gives an output, but that's not perhaps the best value. So what we did then was simply to find that these parameters beta are now given by this matrix. Uh, let's now look at uh, how we can write this. So one thing we can do now, if we go to uh, and use Python, when you have established the matrix, you see now that what I'm using now, since this is a matrix which doesn't cause problems, uh, I can actually perform a standard inversion. So I would have the inversion, I would use the linear algebra package in NumPy, and then I would have the calculate the x transpose times x, and then multiply with x, and then my target is this one. That's my target. That's the energies. That's the uh, true value which I have. And then I have my beta here, which is now given by the uh, parameters. And now I make, a, when I have the optimal parameters beta, I make my prediction. That is my y tilde. And this is simply x, matrix x times beta. So if you go back a little bit, you see now that what you have is up here. You see that uh, your beta is now given by this. So when you have the beta, you can go back and then you can simply set up with beta. So I should have it up here. When you have uh, found beta, the optimal one, which minimizes the cost function, then you have your prediction, the y tilde. So in the code here, if you scroll down a little bit, in the code, then you see that this is my model, y tilde. And then, uh, alternatively, I could have used uh, the least square function, which is included in uh, NumPy. So there's a function LSTSQ. So that's the least square, which uh, then is included in, uh, in NumPy. So you just plug in the matrix X, you need to set up that one. And then you transfer the energies, which is your target. So that's where your target comes in when you set up the, when you perform the multiplications here. So this is uh, as simple as you can do it. Uh, if you want to write your own code, uh, if you're in doubt whether the matrix is invertible or not, you would use a singular value decomposition. Then you would simply call the SVB, which is also included in NumPy. Or you would uh, calculate the pseudo inverse. If you're using scikit-learn to do this, so what I'm doing here is actually the same thing which scikit-learn is doing. And you can then write these functions, so you can look at the, the function which we defined on, uh, on uh, Monday. 
you can define this R2 function. You plug in your data, which is your target, and then you have the model, the Y here. And then you will simply calculate this function by using the sum and calculate the mean values here. So you have the mean of the data. And this is a definition, so you can set up your own R2 score. And then you can simply calculate it. And you see it's 0.95, not so bad. You can set up your own mean squared error, because then you will test your data against the model. So this is the kind of test you're going to run at the end. And that specific test then tells us now that, OK, the model which we fitted gives us now a fit of 0.04 something, which is not so bad. And you can also uh, break this down. Uh, you can look at the relative errors, and you can print that out for every uh, single quantity which you have. It's obviously for the first one here. It is not a number because you're dividing with the data points. And then you see typically that the relative error is just some few percents here. So you see now, if you want to do linear regression, it's actually very easy. So it's easy to get started. Now, uh, I'm going to skip some of the things here because I wanted to get down to uh, some more interesting things. So one thing which we are going to uh, look at now, this is another type of uh, function. So there is a data set in the, uh, in the folder and there is a comma separated file. So this is just to show you the functionality of pandas. So this reads uh, the binding energy per nucleon. So this is a calculation of the uh, equation of state for dense nu nuclear matter as it occurs in a neutron star. So the file which you have, if we now go back to the, uh, to the basic, uh, uh, no, not that one, but I had it. Let me just go back here. Uh, not there. Yeah, let me just bring back here. So there is a, if we now go back to the, um, where we have the uh, basic folder and the GitHub address, if you now go into uh, the different days, like in day two here, and you go to the Jupyter Notebook uh, repository, there are data files, and these are the files I'm reading. So there is a file which is called the equation of state. So the first column is a density in inverse Fermi cubed, and the other one is the energy in uh, the energy density. It's actually energy divided by density. So these are the so these are my targets, the uh, second column, and the inputs are here. These are my y values. And now I want to make a polynomial fit to this data. So what I'm doing now is to do something similar. And uh, now I'm guiding by my insights again about a uh, uh, about the pressure and how we could parameterize that one. So I would have the intercept again, then I have the density to the power of two thirds, functional density, four thirds, and I can go to higher densities. Now here, I've also taken the liberty of introducing uh, uh, ridge regression, and I'm going to explain briefly what ridge regression actually stands for. So the, um, uh, the uh, uh, thing which I'm doing now is to use scikit-learn. So I take the linear regression functionality in scikit-learn, and I'm training on all the data sets which I have. So I give my design matrix, which I have set up, and then I take my targets, the energies, and that gives me now a prediction. So that gives me the y tilde, which is my model. And that's uh, given by this predict function in, uh, in uh, scikit-learn. So my uh, equation of state here is given by y tilde. I can perform another type of linear regression, which is called ridge regression. But that depends on a parameter lambda. And uh, that's a parameter which you can show when you calculate the variance of the parameters which you have. It can actually lead to a uh, variance which, of the parameters beta, which can be smaller. Uh, I'm coming back to some of the mathematical interpretations of these methods. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit, uh, how to say, uh, I'm not going to go too much in depth in these things, but if you have questions, I can direct you to, uh, to the relevant literature. So now I'm just trying to give you a kind of bird's view of it. So the, uh, 
The thing now is that scikit-learn has the functions which we built uh, uh, previously, our own mean squared error, scikit-learn has its own here. So you take the energies, you give in your model estimate, uh, you can calculate the mean absolute error if you want. So all the same quantities which I coded myself are quantities which you can calculate easily with scikit-learn. And scikit-learn has this functionality up here, uh, which is called metrics. And we are going to encounter that again and again, also when we are looking at classification problems. But then the metrics is a little bit different. So these are not the only functions. There are many such functions which you can look at. So uh, if I do that now, you can see that this uh, my mean squared error is perhaps not the very best one. But my model stopped at a density function, uh, a, 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 a a function as a function of density where density ended with being going like density to the power of four thirds. So you see the mean squared error is pretty large, uh, but you also see that this uh, uh, the mean squared error when I use this ridge regression is actually larger. So I'm coming back a little bit to this, but now I want to discuss a technicality, and that deals with the way we do the fits or we make use these machine learning methods. So what we normally do is that we split the data in test and train data. So I could here, uh, in this case, I could now make my design matrix more and more. So suppose now that I, I increase that one to a, a polynomial of a higher order. So I could now redefine here. So I would put in a four, I'm just punching this in by the hard way. So I would have a density. And then, so let's take five divided by three zero. So I could make a high order polynomial. And uh, what we could do now is just to rerun this function. And then we see now in, in the previous case, I had a mean squared error, which was 11. And now you see that I have also reduced the mean squared error down to 6.28. So, uh, this is meant a little bit to anticipate what is going to come now when we are looking at the bias variance trade-off. But here, what I did now is to uh, use all the data to train the model. It means now that if I increase the complexity of my fit, I make a high, more high and high order polynomial, then probably what is going to happen is that I'm going to make a fantastic fit of the data. But that may mean that if I apply this model, this prediction of mine, to data which was not included in the training, I may fail terribly. So one of the things we do is actually to split the data in training and test data. Now, this is easy to do. You can do that with the reshuffling of your data. Uh, Scikit-learn has a function. You can write your own function. But why should you do that when scikit-learn takes your design matrix and there's a function which is just called train test split, period. That makes life very easy. So what you would import then is the model selection package in, in, uh, in scikit-learn and it has a train test split. So what you would do then with the same model which we have here. So I'm, uh, this is just a repeat of all the kind of initial readings. Uh, it sets up the data. Uh, the arrays, I have my density, my energies, which I want to fit. And now I'm making a model here. And you see now that this com now comes the function here. So what I'm doing now is to uh, split my data. So it does a random reshuffle of the data. And it takes my design matrix here, this X. So it requires that this X is actually a matrix. So in case you just have a one-dimensional array, you have to convert it into a matrix of dimensionality n times one. So scikit-learn deals with the X here as a matrix. I transfer my energies, which is a vector. And then it's simply defined that the test size could should be 20%. So what this means is that I am going to place all my data in a kind of vault. I don't touch it. I take 20% of the data and I just put it in a safe place and it's untouched. And then I do all my training on the remaining 80%. And you see now that what I've done here, since I love my own programs, I have my own matrix inversion here. 
and I'm now dealing with the training data, only the training data. So I am making the fit with the training data. And now my target is now given by the train data. So what this does is that it splits the uh, X values and the energies into a train set and a test set. It's not so difficult to make that one. Uh, but when you have it, uh, there's no insight in actually writing your own, unless that it's fun to make it. But when you've done it once, you've done it once. So what you would do then is then to uh, perform uh, this uh, training on uh, the train set. And then you would use now, you see now that I'm making a Y tilde. So this is my training fit. So I take my train data and multiply with the parameter beta, the optimal parameter I find. And then I'm doing the same. So I'm calculating the uh, R2 score and the mean squared error, which are standard metrics for whether your model is a good one or bad one. And then uh, I'm uh, doing the same thing on the test data. And sometimes what happens is that uh, the test data may actually have a better mean squared error. But that's normally uncommon. That's normally not the case. So I'm going to show you now something which we are coming back to. And uh, this is a kind of common feature which you will see again and again. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper in, in the slides here. So and, and we are going to jump a little bit back and forth uh, because I also want to say something about pre-processing of data. But what we are going to look at now is a uh, simple example of uh, a fit where we now are going to deal with this bias variance trade-off. But I'm going to make a much simpler thing here. So this is more or less down to the, to the end of the slides before the exercises. Now, uh, what I have is a, uh, I have 80 data. And I now want to make a fit of a given model with the opto polynomial of degree 18. This is what we have here. So this is my data set. So I'm setting up data from minus 3 to plus 3. And uh, the next thing I'm ending doing now is to make a, a function. So function. So this is my data set. So this is my input and this is my target. So my target is now given by an exponential of x to the minus x squared uh, plus 1.5 times this one. And then there's some random noise here. So that's the model I'm doing. The next thing I do now is to set up the train mean squared error and the test mean squared error. And uh, I'm going to have a loop over the polynomial degree. So the polynomial degree is now going to represent the complexity of my model. So the, uh, what I, I do the train test split, as you see here. So I do that outside. So my data is now split in test and train. Then I use uh, scikit-learn's uh, uh, functionality to fit the polynomial. So if you have just a straight line, you would just use, uh, you, would, you can avoid this, but I'm putting in the polynomial features and I put the degree here uh, in terms of this function in this variable max degree. And you see now that I make my training prediction. So I fit with the train data and I make a prediction with the train data. So this is a kind of chain here. So this gives me my value of beta. And then I use this value of beta from the training to make a prediction. And then I calculate the, means, the uh, mean squared error. This is what you find here. And then I simply plot. And the kind of pattern which you will see in basically every textbook is something like this. So uh, what you're seeing here now is the uh, plot as a function of the polynomial degree. So you can think of the x-axis as increasing complexity. Okay. And then the y-axis is the mean squared error. So if I were to give you, this is something you will see in every textbook, except that in every textbook, this is a pretty smooth curve. In real life, it never looks as smooth as it does in textbooks. 
But what do you see here? What would you say if I were to give you something like that? Any good suggestions? So I know somebody told me to make this figure and then I don't know, I don't, I'm not able to make head or tail out of it. I don't know what, how to use it. So if I wanted to give you guys some advice, uh, what kind of advice would you give based on this figure? If you're now going to fit the data with a, a polynomial fit. Any good suggestions here? Nobody who dares to say anything. So if you look at your train data here, you see now that you're getting a, a basically you're getting a mean square error which is approaching zero. So I'm increasing the complexity and I can train my model to basically give me a perfect reproduction. But then I want to use this model on some data which was not used in the training. So if you if you look at this region here where this uh, test is increasing, uh, what could this be an indication of? Martin, maybe this is the moment to offer another book voucher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So please, anyone interested in a book voucher? Just this is an optimum, yeah. This is a very good answer. Uh, so what would you say, what kind of phenomenon uh, would you say kicks in here? So you find an optimum around 10. So with the data set you have, you would say, okay. Uh, but what do you think happens? in this specific case. There's a, there's a word in, in machine learning uh, which uh, you will encounter again and again. Is it the underfitting or overfitting? Yeah. Overfitting, lovely. So what you see now is that you're coming into a region where you're overfitting. So that means that uh, uh, from here and on, when you're now applying your lovely model, which now has been really fine-tuned to this data set, when you're trying this one on data which was not included in the fit, then you're overfitting. And you see now that the error is increasing. So this goes back to some of the questions which we had in the very beginning uh, of this lecture today, uh, where people asked about uh, how can I say whether this model is a good one or not? And one of the ways you would do then is to make a simple figure like this, where you plot the train and the test mean squared error, and you try to find a point where now the test mean squared error starts increasing. So you see now that in the beginning, uh, the test is it can be close to the train, but then it just keeps staying above the training set. This is a normal picture. Now, there is something more here. The result which I gave you depends on the number of data which you have. So what do you think would happen if I gave you a thousand data points? Would you see a larger difference between the test and the, uh, and the train data? What is your feeling if I give you more data? Would the difference between test and train increase as a function of the complexity or would it decrease? So what's your feeling, guys? Increase or decrease? So if I give you more data now, it's a decrease, exactly. And you can test that immediately here. If we do a thousand, you could even find out that the, uh, uh, perhaps even the train, the train uh, uh, MSE can sometimes become larger than the test. So it's, it's things like that can happen. Uh, so if you rerun now, what you would see now is if you, if you look at the data here, now you see that the uh, the points are getting pretty close to each other and you have even cases this is hey look at that this is a clear decrease and the data almost spot on for train and test because we had much more data for training 
and much more data for test. So that means that the, if I wanted to see a deviation here, I would have to go to much higher complexity of the model to see the deviation. So what you guys are seeing here is this kind of struggle between the quality of the model you have, the fit you're making, and then the uh, number of data points which you have. So the complexity of the model, the number of data points, and the type of model which you end up choosing. So these are things which we always will carry with us. So there is no kind of, uh, uh, how to say, uh, beforehand answer which tells you that this model is the one which will reproduce uh, the data which you have the best possible way. And you will see me returning to this again and again. And one of the reasons why I, I pick these simple models is that this is a kind of vanilla case. And we can play around with uh, as many data points as we want to illustrate what's going on. But in general, if you run an experiment, you may just be stuck with the data you have. And you can't do anything. So the data you have are the data you have. Uh, here, in this uh, very simple case, I mean, you can just play around as you want. So I'm going to go up a little bit again. And I wanted to uh, jump into some technicalities. Uh, so the I mentioned that we had something which is called uh, ridge and lasso regression. But before we do that, uh, there is something which uh, is uh, a little bit important for us. And that is the scaling of the data and pre-processing of data. So I should have this one a little bit. No, this was splitting in test and train. Uh, Scikit-learn has another functionality and that deals with the pre-processing of the data. So there are many ways to pre-process the data. So I could have data which goes from, let's say, the input could go from minus 100 to plus 100. Uh, I may find it convenient to scale it to a domain from 0 to 1. So some of the examples you will find here are given in terms of random numbers which live between 0 and 1, so they're already scaled to 0 and 1. So that doesn't make any sense to scale the input data. So scikit-learn has a lot of functionality, and one is called the standard scaler. And that has the uh, feature that it actually subtracts the mean value from every column in uh, your design matrix. And the hope then is that you can uh, get rid of some outliers. So that's a standard thing which is done with your data set, is to use a standard scaler. And then you have this min-max scaler, where you scale the data between 0 and 1, uh, all the elements. You have something which is called a normalizer. There's something called a robust scaler. And what follows down here is a function which is a little bit more complicated. It's a polynomial. And it's, a, it's an exponential with as a function of x and y. And you can see the different terms here. So it receives x and y. But in this specific case, you will now see the way I use the standard scalar. So I'm setting up my uh, polynomial, uh, this uh, function, uh, and I set up my train data. But I can now use the standard scalar in scikit-learn, and that will scale my train data. It also scales my test data. So it has this functionality with scalar transform, which does the job for you. But for the standard scaler, it's actually very easy because the thing you need to do is simply to subtract the mean values from each column of the features. So that's something which you can easily do yourself. But it's very common to scale the data and that often takes away some of the outliers. Uh, it's also common to take away the intercept when you're making a fit to the model. And the uh, uh, you will then often see that it gives a better fit uh, if you do the scaling of the data. The kind of data which we have been looking at till now, uh, there you won't see any change because there are no, no outliers. They have been pretty simple, this nuclear uh, binding energy data and so on, they are pretty simple. But you may have data with a lot of noise and then scaling the data becomes important. So the uh, before we stop, I wanted now to mention uh, what actually happens with ridge and lasso. So when we looked at the ordinary least squares, what we did was simply to minimize 
the function which you see here. So my model is x times beta, or these functions y here. And this is normally given in terms of a norm 2 vector. So norm 2 vectors, a norm 2 vector is now given by this sum of all the squared matrix elements, and then it's the square root of that quantity. So if you square that one, as you see up here, that is the same as, it's just another way of writing this expression. Now, ridge regression can be, you can mathematically link that to a Lagrangian with Lagrangian multipliers. So you can think of this lambda as a Lagrangian multiplier. It was introduced historically as a cheat, a way to just get rid of a, a matrix inversion problem by plugging in a parameter lambda uh, along the diagonal. And when you take the derivatives now uh, of, uh, ridge exp of this expression here, when you minimize this function, this specific function, when you perform this minimization problem, what you end up with is actually a problem which looks like the uh, standard uh, ordinary squares, except that the matrix now has a diagonal multiplied with this lambda. Uh, you can actually show mathematically that for specific cases you can get a uh, variance of the parameters beta uh, and also a mean squared error which is smaller as a function of this lambda than you would have with ordinary least squares. So these are called shrinkage methods because they actually shrink uh, the importance of some of the features. So I'm just trying to give you this kind of more general overview of what these methods are doing. So one of the things these methods actually do is that they may actually shrink away or reduce the importance of uh, specific features which are not that important when you're setting up your model. And uh, uh, so it's in, in principle, it's a way to reduce the dimensionality. So the... Uh, other very popular method is lasso regression, where we use the norm one. That leads to a convex optimization problem where we have now the derivative of an absolute value. So for lasso regression, you can show mathematically that you can drive specific terms or specific features to zero. So that's a way to reduce the dimensionality. Uh, lasso regression can also reduce the mean squared error for specific values of lambda. But that depends again, uh, it's dependent again from problem to problem. So ridge regression looks like this. So the beta ridge is now almost equal to the same equation which we had for ordinary least squares, except that the matrix to invert is always stable. So we never run into problems with uh, singular matrices. And then uh, for uh, lasso regression, you would have to deal with the convex optimization algorithms. And uh, Python has a package which is called CVXOpt, which allows you to solve these type of problems. But scikit-learn has uh, built that in, so it's actually running these calculations. And you can see one thing you can do with ridge regression. If you now assume that the matrix is orthonormal, so that means it's equal to an identity matrix, then you can show that the ridge, the parameters beta for ridge here, will actually be reduced by 1 plus this lambda multiplied with the standard ordinary least squares. And if you go into this paper by van Veringen, you will see derivations where they show that the mean squared error with ridge regression can be reduced as a function of lambda compared to ordinary least squares. And one of the things we always want is to reduce the mean squared error. So if you're looking after a little bit deeper uh, mathematical interpretation, take a look at this paper. That contains a lot of details. So what I'm going to start on Friday, because I didn't reach go, go through everything here, is actually to start to look at some statistical analysis. And these are resampling techniques. So I will cover this on Friday in, in the first lecture, and then we move on to logistic regression in the next lecture. So I'm going to have to stop here. Please feel free to ask as many questions as you want here. Yeah, thank you very much, Morten. That was really excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, let's see if we get a question without a book voucher. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I double on my offer. Yeah. Um. 
think we have a more timid audience today, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's see if it uh, changes. Um, you can what always. Do you, what do you think? Should we offer one more book voucher? <laughs> <laughs> You can always send me an email. I just put my email address in here again, in case you yeah. want to. Thank you very much. I think one book voucher per lecture is okay. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, please don't let, let's not become too too materialistic. <clears throat> maybe maybe what we should do next time is we offer a book voucher for the best question. That's probably the better, the better approach. So <laughs> tomorrow we have a system that for every lect every in every lecture we will reward the best uh, the best question, yeah? and, uh, so that uh, people are motivated to ask more. Yeah? Okay, the only one who can't win the book voucher is Ilya. Yeah, because he <laughs> he also answered some questions, but he he won't get a book voucher. Okay, here comes the question. Yeah, this is excellent. So so the um, this is actually uh, there is no kind there's a, there's a kind of rule of thumb. So you this becomes a parameter. So how you split the data? So one of the things which uh, uh, disappoints people with many of these machine learning methods is that you have many parameters. So what you need to do then is to play around with the, uh, the splitting ratio here. So typically as a kind of rule of thumb, people do from two thirds of the data to 90% of the data. Uh, that depends on how much data you have. So in my case, I just did an 80% to 20%, but that was just a choice I made. And you will see that most practitioners, they land on this type of, uh, of splitting, but there is no kind of golden rule here. Uh, what I did was also to take only test and train but often what you would do now, since we have introduced ridge regression, you would have a hyperparameter. So what you would do then, you could take 80% of the data for training and validation. So you would then run 60% on training, and then you would have a validation set where you fine trim the hyperparameters. So you then have, a, suppose you have 10 hyperparameters, then you uh, use the validation part to find the best hyperparameter. So this could be this value of lambda. So suppose there's a value of lambda which gives you the best possible mean squared error. And that can happen. Then you would use this value of lambda to then feed into the test uh, training of the, of the model. So the, the validation set is often used when you want to settle on the hyperparameter. Because if I do the training on sub something, let's say 10 hyperparameters. If you take these values of lambda, uh, I can show you an example here down in the uh, in the Jupyter notebook. There is an example at the uh, at the end here. Uh, let me just see here where I actually did a kind of training uh, with the uh, uh, not that one. Yeah, you can see here now. This is the mean squared error where I now perform a calculation with several values of this hyperparameter lambda. And you see that there is a sudden dip in this region here. So I would perform the training on, let's say, 60%, and then I would use perhaps some 10 or 20% now to fine tune so I find the optimal parameter lambda. With that optimal parameter lambda, I would then move on to the test uh, mean squared error. In this calculation here, what I did was simply to do a train test. So some people tend to skip the, uh, the validation part and just do a train test. But it's often used to uh, fine tune the best hyperparameter for the model. And, and you will see that uh, when we move on to neural networks, there are going to be many more parameters. So one of the parameters we are going to introduce is something like the learning rate, the way to optimize the gradients, because we are not able to find analytical expressions for the parameters. So these are very good questions, actually. And the, uh, uh, what you will see is that machine learning is actually you running many, many different uh, types of calculation with different sets of parameters. And then you try to find the best parameters, which, or those parameters which give you the best score like the mean, the lowest mean squared error. 
and that's the one you will bring to the next party. Uh, if you bring that to the parties, maybe that's the reason why nobody invites me to parties anymore. <laughs> okay, we, we will invite you to a party yeah. in South Africa, Morton, as I soon as as soon as we can fly again. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay, so maybe this is the the the, the, the perfect uh, point to to come to to an end. All good things come to an end. Even all good lectures come to an end. And so, Morten, thank you, thank you so much for another excellent lecture and for sharing the the, the Git uh, video that uh, I think many people were keen of watching. And uh, thank you for the participants for for engaging. <laughs> I think the book voucher method does miracles, so we will stick to that system. <laughs> and, um, sorry for Ilya who didn't win it. And um, and we will see you again tomorrow morning at nine. And if I remember correctly, uh, Martin Bucher is speaking tomorrow morning. Yeah. So have a good uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, please keep playing with the uh, Jupyter notebooks and and watch the Git video. Yeah. Okay, Morten, thank you very much again, and we yeah. we will see you on Friday. Oh, yeah. if my calculation yeah. <laughs> is correct. <laughs> yeah. See you guys. Take care. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Morten. And okay. stay warm in yeah. Norway. Yeah. I hear you, see. The next book is mine here. Eh? Somebody already has. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Very, very good. So start thinking of questions for tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Thanks, guys. Eh? Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Have a good afternoon.